So I'm here to talk, my, talk about my book, Locking Up Our Own. And I thought I'd start by talking about what kind of brought me to, to want to write this book. And, and there's two reasons, really. The first one has nothing to do with the criminal justice system at all. And that's, I don't know if any of you are like this, but I'm the kind of person who, when I go to a movie, and if there have been no African American characters in the movie, at the end of the movie when somebody says to me, you know, what did you think of that movie? My answer, before I can get into the details of the movie, my first question is always, well, where were the black characters? And I feel that way about, about film, I feel that way about literature, I feel that way about art, I feel that way about history, I feel that way about workplaces, I feel that way about law. So I knew that I wanted to write a book that had African American characters front and central in the narrative. And then the other reason is really very much has to do with the criminal justice system. So this is a book that has a lot of history and it has a lot of stories. And one of those stories involves a young man by the name of Brandon. Brandon was 15 years old. He was my client in juvenile court in Washington, D.C., mid-1990s. And I had taken the job because I viewed this work as the civil rights work of my generation. My parents had met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, Tony Orange, are you out here? Yeah, he's here. So he, was, he, he met my dad and worked with my dad in Los Angeles in SNCC. And is there anybody else here who was, who was involved in SNCC, involved in, in the movement in the 1960s in any way? Okay, well, my parents met in that organization and in that movement, and I felt like now, a generation later, I had opportunities that were impossible to imagine for my father's generation. You heard the bio, I was clerking on the Supreme Court, now I had the chance to be this public defender. But at the same time, it was apparent to me that not everybody had prospered in that way. We didn't have the term mass incarceration then, hadn't come up with it yet. But we already knew that the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to become the world's largest jailer. We already knew that the United States, with 5% of the world's population, had 25% of its prisoners. We already knew, because the sentencing project had reported it, that by the mid-1990s, one in three young African-American men was under criminal justice supervision. So that's why I had taken the job, and I was in court asking Brandon, asking that Brandon be put on probation. He had pled guilty to possession of a gun, possession of a small amount of marijuana, and now he was facing sentencing. I had letters from a football coach and from teachers attesting to his character. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They had been there for every court hearing. They were ready to take him home. Brandon, like almost all of my clients, was African-American. The prosecutor in the case was asking that he be locked up. She said that he needed to be sent a lesson for possession of that gun. He could have hurt somebody. She wanted him to go to Oak Hill. The prosecutor was also African-American. Oak Hill, the place she wanted him sent, was a dungeon. The city didn't admit that, but we all knew it. The Washington Post had written story after story about what a hellhole it was. No functioning school, no job training programs, no drug treatment programs, some things on paper, but nothing for real. The judge who had to make the decision, Judge Curtis Walker, also African American. So he looks out at the courtroom, he's got this young black man facing sentencing, these two African American lawyers arguing for opposite sides of the case. And he leans back and he looks into Brandon and he says, Son, Mr. Foreman has been telling me that you've had a hard life and that you deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about hard. Let me tell you about Jim Crow. Let me tell you about segregation. See, the judge had grown up in that era. He knew what it was like. And he proceeded to tell Brandon. And as he was wrapping up, he said, so here's the thing. People marched, fought, and died for you to be free. Dr. King died for you to be free. And I tell you this, 
He didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your community and your family. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around. But right now, son, actions have consequences. And your consequence is okay. kill. And he locked him up. I went back and visited Brandon in the, the cell block, three young African-American men in there with him. And ever since that day, I thought about the fact that, to put it mildly, not everybody in this community agree, agreed with me and my colleagues that fighting over incarceration was the civil rights issue of our generation. The judge had taken the same history that had motivated me to become a public defender, and he had flipped it and used it as a reason to justify not only this lecture, but a juvenile prison sentence. And the judge wasn't alone. The city council that passed the laws under which Brandon was sentenced, that was a majority African-American city council, 11 out of 13 members in the original one in 75. The police chief was black. The police department was majority black. And so it occurred to me then that somebody needed to write a history, a story, hopefully with nuance, with empathy, with compassion, recognizing the pressure that people were under. But somebody read, needed to write a story about how it was that this first generation of African-American elected officials, police officers, prosecutors, judges, had ended up in many cases following the same choices, the same path that the nation had followed. What had we been doing in our community to end up locking up so many of our own? And so that's the question for me, the question of the book. Now, I could stop here and say, okay, the answer's in the book, let's, you know, go buy it. But y'all came out here and they told me I was supposed to talk for about 30, 35 minutes, so I can't end here. Let me give you kind of the highlights of, of the argument. The first thing that we have to understand, and that I write about, is the incredible levels of crime and violence and addiction that were consuming black America in the crack years, yes, but also in the 1960s in the heroin years. See, because heroin was the crack before there was crack. In Washington, D.C., in 1963, they tested everybody that was entering the D.C. jail for heroin. 3% tested positive. By 1969, it was 45%. And it wasn't just D.C., Cleveland, Memphis, Chicago, Oakland, Los Angeles, New York. Similar numbers. The homicide rate in D.C. tripled in the 1960s. Nationally, it doubled. And it's not just the numbers. It's not just the statistics. One of the things I did in my research is I went and I found, I looked at letters from African-American elected officials who had retired and had given their papers over to, to various libraries around the D.C. area. And when you look through that material, what you see is this pain and suffering from citizens who are writing to their elected officials. I came across letter after letter of people saying, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger on my streets. I can't go outside because they're selling drugs on the corner. I can't leave my kid in the playground after school because they're shooting. You have to do something. You have to protect us. What has happened to our community? Now, who's receiving these letters? This gets to the second part of the story. The people that are receiving these letters are this first generation of African-American elected officials. Nationally, there's an 800% increase in black elected officials in the 1970s after the decline of formal Jim Crow. Still too few, but a lot more than there had been. These folks, many of them, came out of the movement. A lot of them were from the South. And all of them understood the history of under-protection, under-enforcement of the law in African-American communities. Chapter 2 of my book is called Black Lives Matter because they didn't use the term, 
But this was the idea. This was the motivation. These were folks that they remembered when you didn't, you didn't call the police in a black neighborhood when there was a, there was a, a fight or a crime or a robbery because they weren't going to come. And if they did, they were just going to make matters worse. They were, remember when sheriffs, mostly in the South, but not just in the South, in cahoots with the Klan, they said, it wasn't murder when it was a dead black person. That's just another dead black person. And they did not use the words black person. So they remember this history. They come into office. They are bound and determined to protect these lives, to make black lives matter to use everything at their disposal to protect a community that for hundreds of years, since brought over as slaves, had been denied that protection. But why police? And why prosecutors? And why prisons? Why protect black life that way? This gets to the third big piece of the story which is that the people that I'm writing about, these African-American elected officials, police officers, prosecutors, judges, probation officers, parole officers, they are not acting without constraints. They're not acting without limits. This is a story I said up front that I wanted to write a story about with black people front and center as decision makers. But any story of African-American actions and agency is also a story of the constraints and the limitations on that agency. Some of those constraints are historical, right? The folks that I'm writing about, black elected officials, because of a history of racism and white supremacy, means that they have to protect communities that have been disenfranchised that had been deindustrialized, that had been undereducated, that had been stripped of their wealth, that had been segregated and isolated, and had been ignored. Those were the neighborhoods they were responsible for protecting. And the other constraint is a combination of politics and racism. The officials that I'm writing about are local officials. They're city, black elect, black political office holders are overwhelmingly concentrated in cities. And cities are important, but they're not the only thing that matter for policy. And in particular, the folks that I'm writing about, they didn't control the federal government. So you see time and time again in my research, I see people who say, we want police, we want prosecutors. Some people even say we want prisons. But they also want housing and jobs and education and drug treatment and mental health programs and parks that aren't full of syringes. And they don't get those things because they're making pleas to a national government that won't hear them. They say over and over again, following Congressman Conyers from Michigan. We want a Marshall Plan for urban America. We want this nation to treat black communities the way America treated Europe after World War II and reinvest and develop and revitalize. But we didn't get that. The people that I'm writing about didn't get that. What they got was law enforcement. So those are kind of the big arguments of the book, the big points about how it is that we got here. And I want to spend a little bit of time, especially in this community, because I know that this is a place where, more so than some other places that I go to talk, where people are kind of pushing forward. There's a re kind of a reform momentum that, that you see. There's a lot of things that you're doing here in Seattle and King County which are which are not being replicated across the country. And so I want to talk a little bit about what this history that I'm writing about, what it means for contemporary political debates, debates about the future of our criminal justice system. And the first thing that I want to say, the first thing that I want this, if this book is only used for one thing in our national debate, 
this is the, this is the thing that I pray that it will be used for. Because one of, and I, and I know the um, professor from Princeton is coming and she's going to be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement in, in a couple of weeks. So one of the things that comes up whenever there is protest about police violence from the right, so I quote Rudy Giuliani in this book, but I could have quoted many other people too. Is African Americans protest some act of police violence and then Rudy Giuliani or somebody like him says, how come they only care about police violence? How come there's never any complaints about so-called black-on-black -black crime? He doesn't say so-called, but I'll say it. Now, there's a lot of answers to that question, right? Not least, you know, of course we hold law enforcement to a higher standard than we do criminal gangs. But that's not the main point. The main point is that this is a 240-page rebuttal to the argument that African Americans have not cared about violence in black communities. Black communities and their leaders have been consumed by the issue and have always thought of it as a civil rights issue. So the next time you hear a Giuliani type say that, shove the book in their direction. But beyond that, beyond that, I, I, I want to talk about what we can do to get out of the crisis, the human rights crisis that is, that is mass incarceration and what I think some of this history tells us about what to do. I think kind of overarching message of my book is that it's so tempting to look for a particular moment when we got mass incarceration, right? It's so tempting to identify a speech from Nixon or Reagan or, or a particular executive action. But the truth is that's not how this system was built. This system was built instead by a series of micro acts, some of them tiny, imperceptible, across 50 states and the federal government and the District of Columbia, 3,000 counties, and over a 40 and 50 year period. And if everybody moves in that direction, right, if everybody from police officers to prosecutors to judges to probation officers to parole officers, if everyone gets 10, 15, 20 percent harsher, almost without even seeing it. If everybody does that at the same time over 50 years, we get 2.2 million people in prison and 7 million people under criminal justice supervision and we can't even count how many people who have lost their right to vote and lost other basic rights because of criminal convictions. We get it with a series of micro acts, and there's sometimes acts that are even coming from well-intentioned people. So one of the folks that I write about in the book, there's a lot of examples of this in the book, but one that I'll share with you. This guy named Dave Clark. He's actually one of the, mostly this book is mostly about African-American officials. He's one of the white guys who gets a lot of, uh, of airtime in the book. He's a civil rights activist, went to Howard Law School, gets elected to the DC Council. He's not a drug warrior. He supports legalization of marijuana in the 1970s. Then he becomes the chief of the city council. And he gets letters from citizens. These letters that I was describing to you, a lot of them about, uh, use, this is the language of the, of the letter, I don't endorse it, but you know, there's a junkie out in front of my house, my apartment, my business. You gotta do something about it. He takes those letters he forwards them to government agency. Then he gets a letter back from the chief of the government agency. And he then forwards that response to the citizens. So this is like, this is great service, constituent service. You write your city council member, they make the request, they let you know what they've done. But here's the thing, this guy, not a drug warrior, did he send the complaint to the Department of Addiction Services, to the Department of Mental Health, to the Department of Health? No, he sent it to the police department because he was constrained by his own imagination. We've all become constrained by a lack of imagination. We understand things 
that we should think of as public health issues, we understand them as criminal justice issues, including people strung out on the corner in front of somebody's business. So the, this is an example, when I'm talking about of the micro acts over 50 years across systems that built mass incarceration. We're gonna to have to dismantle it the same way. There isn't gonna be a single action, there's not gonna be you know, a reform-oriented president and attorney general, not even to mention our, our current ones, who are ever gonna solve this for us. So what do we do? One of the first things, and this is a lesson that's less crucial for y'all because compared to most places, this is an example of where you're doing pretty well, but we need, right, by comparison, I'm sure there's, I'm sure that what I'm about to say that there's further, there's more that can be done. But local prosecutors, county and city prosecutors are the most powerful single actor in our criminal justice system. Everybody, you know, Jeff Sessions is getting a lot of attention right now, but remember, he's in charge of 12% of our prison population. 88% is state, county, and local. And this past election, back in November, for the first time in my lifetime, people ran for prosecutor on a campaign of, we're locking up too many people in America. The drug wars run them up. My predecessor participated in wrongful convictions. You didn't run, this is not how you ever ran for prosecutor in my lifetime. A guy in Corpus Christi, Texas, Texas now, defense attorney with the words not guilty tattooed on his chest, ran for prosecutor and won. The reformers won in Florida, in Alabama, in Colorado, in, in Houston, and in Corpus Christi, Texas. An hour ago, I got the best criminal justice news of the day, from my standpoint. A guy, there was just a race. They've, anybody from Philadelphia? Went to the polls in Philadelphia today. There was a guy, a civil rights lawyer. First of all, again, no civil rights lawyer ever ran for DA in my lifetime until this past year. He was, he, he threw his hat in the ring with two months. It was, it was gonna be regular mainstream, lock them up types running against each other for prosecutor. He saw what happened last November and he said, I'm gonna, and he ran on an anti-mass incarceration platform. They just voted, he won 30, he won, he beat, he won by 36% of the vote in a seven person. So he's the democratic nominee and in Philadelphia, that, that's the general election. So he's gonna be the, the next DA. In, now, Philadelphia voters have to hold him accountable because a lot of people run and then they, they turn around. But this is getting involved in local politics and getting people who are progressive elected at the local level is the most important thing we can do. The other side of it is the defense side. So this book in a lot of ways is a, lo a love letter to public defenders. There's story after story of Valiant public defenders. I hadn't even realized this, but somebody said to me, you know, I like a judge who commented on the book recently said, I really like how you, uh, you criticize everybody in the book, but you're fair to everybody. And when he said that, I realized that he was actually wrong about one thing. I don't criticize public defenders at all. <laughs> We're like the heroes in this book. But then the sad part, right? So 2% of our, 2% uh, of, of what we spend in criminal justice spending in this country is spent on public defender, 2%. One of the stories that I tell in the book, I tell lots of stories about work that my colleagues and I did. One of the stories I tell is about a young man who had been convicted of a violent crime, but he had a really, really difficult background. His mother had been a drug addict, had abandoned him to the streets, and, as, and, and he had a lot of potential in particular, he was incredible working with his hands, and so I got him into this job training program, but the only way I was gonna get the judge, who, who was the same judge that I told you about in that opening story, that judge, Curtis Walker, the only way he was gonna ever agree to let this guy who had pled guilty to armed robbery to go to this program was if the victim of the crime 
said he agreed. So I spent hours at the victim's home. So I tell the story in the book, and a public defender came up to me a couple, few weeks ago and said, you know, that's really inspiring, but you need to understand that I have 300 cases at a time, and you had more time to talk to the victim in that case than I have to talk to my client normally. Right, so until we change, so the next time there's a ballot measure or other opportunity to vote for increased funding for public defenders in your community, that's got to be a critical item. Now, that's the criminal justice system. But I want to talk in my last couple of minutes about what people can do, because most people in the room, your voters, yes, but most people aren't full-time thinking about the criminal justice system. But we all, one of the big arguments in my book is that we all built this, either actively or because of we were complicit, because we were silent. We allowed our tax dollars to be used for this. And we all have an obligation to unbuild it. One of the things that you can do that people should think about is most folks in this room are an employee or an employer. Most people work in a company. What's your company's policy about hiring people that have criminal convictions? The Ford Foundation does amazing work on criminal justice reform. They recently were presenting their work at a prison in New York. And after they did the whole presentation, and the CEO of Ford was there, Darren Walker, and they did this presentation, and one of the guys who was locked up said, that's an amazing presentation. I'm really inspired. I just have one question. When I get out, would the Ford Foundation hire me? And they couldn't answer that question. But to their credit, they went back. They found out the answer was no. They scrubbed their HR policies. And they changed them to make, it, to make themselves an employer that was much more welcoming. So they still eventually ask about criminal involvement. But now they do it at the very end of the process, not up front. And I've seen the difference in my own life that that can make. The, you, it was mentioned in the introduction that I started a charter school. When we started it, we hired a bunch of employees, and we were upstart. We didn't, we weren't even thinking about asking people about criminal records. And then two days into our, we had hired everybody, and then two days in to the job, a young man came, African American, came into the office. He sat down with me and the co-founder of the program, and he said, "You know, I'm two days into training, and I just have to tell y'all something. Nobody asked me, but." I feel like I need to tell you that I was convicted of a crime and I'm on parole. And we said, okay, you know, tell us more. And it was armed robbery. Now I'm going to tell you this. I am super committed to this work and I'm super open hearted. But like any employer, if I get 100 applications, one of the things you're looking to do is narrow the stack down, right, just so you can get a manageable number. And if that had just been a question on page one of our application, I don't know that we ever would have brought him in for an interview, let alone hired him. But now, that fact of his armed robbery conviction, and he gave us the paperwork and letter from his parole officer, that fact wasn't the only thing that I knew about him. Right, I, kn I knew he was, had a big heart and had a lot of energy and was going to be great with kids, right? I knew all of that, and I knew that he had this conviction. So it was still a hard case, but we kept him on. And he's, he's a national leader in criminal justice. For, that was 20 years ago. He's a, I mean, you've probably heard of him. He's in DC. So that's employers. But it's not just employers, right? Because is anybody here connected with a university in any way? Like you work at a university, professor, student, yeah. So universities, like employers, have a really wide range of approaches to people that have criminal records. Some people just ask up front, right on page one, and send a message that, you know what, if you check this box, you might not even fill out the application because you're not going to get hired. And other places consider it as part of their holistic review of the applicant at the end of the process, after they've learned everything else and after they've admitted the student. And the research shows that if you have that second kind of process, you admit and accept many more students that have criminal convictions than if you have the first kind of process where you threaten people and scare them even before they apply. Churches and religious institutions are another thing that we have to, I think, 
spend some time thinking about. We have 900,000 people that come out of prison and jail every year. Most of those people, the biggest obstacle is that they don't have any connections. They don't have networks. They don't have somebody who can help them with even small things. Figuring out how to fill out that job application, giving them a ride to the job application, helping them figure out where they can apply for housing, getting an ID. You get out of prison, the only ID you have is a prison ID, and most people won't accept that. So you need an ID. It costs 20 30 $40 to get an ID. People say, well, it's only 20 or 30 $40. If you don't have any dollars, $30 is a million dollars. You don't have it. We have 340,000 churches, synagogues, mosques, temples in this country. That means that in each one of our religious institutions, if we adopted three people, I'm not talking about hundreds, I'm talking about three. Three people a year coming back to our community and said, we'll be your rock, we'll be your home, we'll be your welcoming place that will help you get an ID apply for a job, apply for housing. That would go a long way towards transforming the reentry crisis that produces so much recidivism. Last thing I'll just say on this about the question of what we can do. I've been thinking a lot about this and I've been going out and giving talks for the last few years sort of telling people about the ways we can reform our criminal justice system and kind of making this argument that you know, we all have a sphere of influence, a domain that we can control, and we all have to, to not just say, well, what can you do about it, but what can I do about it? And so then I really started taking that to heart. And I started thinking about, I'm a professor, I teach a class, I love teaching, but I teach, you know, at one of the most elite universities in the country, in the world, what am I doing? And so I got trained in a program called Inside Out. And this is a program that, tra train tr that trains professors. And you don't have to be a criminal justice expert, all topics, that trains you to teach your class in a prison. So now, the same class that I used to teach at Yale Law School and race class in the criminal justice system, now I teach it inside a Connecticut prison. 10 students that are incarcerated and 10 students from the law school learning together in a seminar setting, learning the same material, learning from each other. Now, the main reason to do this is not a self-interested one. It is also true, I will say, that I got the best teaching evaluations that I've ever gotten in my career <laughs> from this class. And that's from the Yale students who have a formal evaluation system, but, but the most meaningful ones were from the inside students, the incarcerated students. One of the guys wrote at the end of the class, he said, I like learning the policy and the law, but he said really the thing that was the most meaningful to me was that every time we came to class, we sat around in a circle and people treated me like I was smart and I had something to say, that I was an intellectual. He said that has never happened to me in my life. The, the thrill is that he has that experience. The tragedy is that he's never had that experience in school before. He was never treated like he had something to say. Another guy in the class wrote, he said, for two hours a week, every week, I felt like I wasn't in prison. So this class, changing the employer, rules, universities admitting students, electing progressive prosecutors, funding indigent defense, treating addiction as a public health issue, not a criminal justice issue. None of these things by themselves is going to undo mass incarceration. But collectively, as a community, if we do all of them, and we do all of them at the same time, and we all pitch in, and we all accept our responsibility, then, I don't know, I'll come back some years from now, and I'll have written a book about the generation that took down mass incarceration. Thank you.
do have time for some questions from the audience. And if you do have a question, we ask that you come up to the microphones on either side of the stage so everyone can hear you. And um, please keep your question in the form of a question. Also, y'all were telling the truth. Lisa Dugar did, did come. <laughs> Thank you um, so much for being here, Professor. Um, so I, I think you disagree with Michelle Alexander's uh, analogy with the new Jim Crow in our current system of mass incarceration. Uh, so you don't have to comment on that. Uh, but she proposes crashing the system to reform the system where she believes that public defenders and criminal defense attorneys should just go to trial and somehow that burden the system. Um, I'm wondering if you can just say a little bit about whether or not you disagree or disagree with this and why. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So on, I mean, I should, I'll respond to that particular kind of that suggestion, which I think is an interesting and important one. But even beyond that, I should say that I don't disagree with her argument to the extent that she's identifying racism and white supremacy as major drivers of what has produced the criminal justice system that we have today. And I also very much agree with the idea, sorry, I can't see where the gentleman who asked the question, thank you, thank you, sorry. I, I also very much agree with the idea that one way in which our criminal justice system is very much like Jim Crow is that both of them give you a status and a stigma that marks you for life and that is almost impossible to escape. So my book is full of stories of people who made one mistake, right? There's a woman that I write about named Sandra Dozier, who I met when she came to my office for what we call duty day. And duty day is the day when lawyers just put away your cases and you respond to questions from the general public. And my audience, in, in my office, we had to do it about once every other month. And this woman came in and she explained to me that she had been stopped by the police. They had asked to search her car. She had agreed. They had found $20 worth of marijuana in her glove box. She had told them Please don't arrest me. I have a job at FedEx. And she pointed to her uniform in the back seat. The officers actually were pretty reasonable and said, yeah, we're not going to take you in. We're not going to book you and hold you overnight because we know that means you're going to miss your job the next day if we do that. And they had the discretion to just give her a notice to appear in court. She shows up in court. And the case is no papered, which is in D.C. court lingo dismissed by the prosecution. So, so far, everybody in the criminal justice system has actually been operating like pretty leniently and pretty reasonably. But why was she singled out to be stopped in the first place? Because she lived in a community that had been identified as a community, and this is not me making it up, this is Eric Holder on the record on interviews in DC in the mid 1990s saying, we are putting police in these neighborhoods and we are going to have them stop everybody on, mi on minor pretexts and ask them to search the cars because we're looking for guns. And she lived in one of those neighborhoods. They didn't find any guns, but they found $20 of marijuana. Now, her case gets no paper, but to get off probation at FedEx, she has to bring in a certificate of clean record. She goes to the courthouse to get that certificate and the arrest for marijuana shows up. She brings it into her employer because she feels like, well, it got dismissed and no papered and they'll understand. But they had a rule that even if you were arrested while you were on probationary status, No problem. <laughs> I was going to keep going for a while, and then everybody was looking, and I was like, you know what? Nobody's listening to Sandra Dozier and her arrest. 
So let's just let that thing ring out and then we'll go back to the story. It's happened to all of us. It's happened to all of us. So Sandra Dozier loses her job. Now, when she left my office that day, she left behind. I, I tried everything. I called. I spoke to her supervisor. Nice guy. Heard me out. He was like, I didn't make the policy. I think this is crazy, but this is the policy. She leaves my office. I'm, we, we, you cry a lot in the public defender's office because it's so unfair. I'm on the verge of tears. She leaves my office. At the end of the day, I'm cleaning off my desk. I find a file. She was very organized, this Sandra Dozier. She had left accidentally this file. It had in it her high school diploma from Baloo High School. This is a high school with a 40, 50% dropout rate, but she had graduated. She had siblings that were in the criminal justice system. She had told me that. But she had made it through, had never been arrested until this time. She had an intern of the month certificate that she had gotten from an employer when she had had an, a, D, a DC government internship in high school. And on top of that, she had a printout from the court system. Now, in a just world, we would have called Sandra Dozier a person with grit, a striver, somebody who overcame incredible obstacles and unfairness to graduate from high school, never be arrested, be intern on the month, stand on job lines at jobs fairs for a year and a half, get a job at FedEx, do that job well. Her supervisor had told her she did an amazing, told me she did a great job. That's one of the reasons why he was sorry about this. None of that mattered. What mattered was the top printout, one line, possession of marijuana. So that is a status and a stigma that attaches to her for a lifetime. And one of the very, very impressive things about Michelle Alexander's book, among other books, is to point that out. So I very much agree with that. Other work in the same vein, Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, ta Coates's book, Between the World and Me. These are books that have powerfully and persuasively and urgently described all of the ways in which racism has helped to create American society that we all live in and the criminal justice system that we live with. And I view this as sitting alongside those works. I don't view it as a rebuttal. I don't view it as a disagreement. I view it as telling a part of the story, building on those works, and then telling a part of the story that hasn't fully been told yet. Because we still need to understand what's going on with Judge Curtis Walker. So, crashing the gates in particular. I, the, the, the underlying point in that article that Michelle Alexander wrote is that we, our system only survives because of all of the guilty pleas. That 95% of cases plead out. If we didn't, if defense lawyers didn't allow their clients to plead, then the system would come to a crashing halt. That is absolutely correct. It's also not how a defense attorney can ethically operate. That is true as a policy matter. She's absolutely right. But individually, see, I represent a client. That client deserves the best representation that I can provide because that client, the guy next to me, We'll use Brandon as an example. All his life, he's had people in power take advantage of him, ignore what he wants, make arguments about what the system needs, and not listen to him. And if you're doing a, your job as a public defender, you, have, you don't make the decision about whether somebody pleads. So the whole notion that we should stop pleading, our, it's not our decision. We can, I can advise him, but I would have to advise him. The advice would have to go something like this. So Brandon, if you take this plea, let's assume these are the facts, I think there's a much greater likelihood that you will get probation. Let's just say these are the facts. If you go to trial, 
we might win, but you had the gun on you, and I don't really, we don't have a good defense for that. If you get convicted, you're likely to get more time. Now, we have this political project afoot where we're not going to, we don't want people to plead. So I would like you to take it to trial because if everybody takes it to trial, we'll like eventually gum up the system, but you're probably going to serve more time <laughs> along the way. And I could tell him something like that, and then he would ha make the decision that he would make. And I think it's, right, it's perfectly appropriate for clients to make decisions factoring in the political realities, right? They could use their case as a way to launch a revolution in the courthouse. But that's what I'd have to tell him. And most people, I think, are going to be like, I'll do the revolution thing later. Right now, I'm trying to not be locked up. <laughs> I hope you could spend as much time on the question I want to get into in the whole audience. All right. As everyone in this. Oh, no, no. I said a bad framework. That's okay, like in class. Sorry. They never say you should do that because then those know. are the expectations. Because I'm a political activist for many years around police murder, and I've seen mm. so many and talked to so many families that have just been treated horribly themselves just because their kids were murdered by the police. Mm. And I, I don't. I'm not working on reforms, but I appreciate what public defenders do because it's a hell of a job and the whole thing about 95% of the cases pleading out. And I've come to this hall for a long time and got frustrated a lot because people come here and they're really concerned about what's going on, but it doesn't seem like a lot of activism comes out of it. And we're now facing the possibility of a fascist with nuclear arms doing, every day he does something more. Mm -hmm. And it's shaking people up and that's a good thing. But there, we have a whole cabal of fascists in there and they need to be out of there. And so I'm part of a whole movement to do that and I hope you've heard about it back there on the East Coast. But I, I, what do you think about the fact that we cannot wait to 2018 to elect a few officials? We've got most of the Democrats going along We've got very few of them calling them out as fascists and standing with the masses against it. So we're in a very critical period. Chicago, there's war on Chicago now from Trump. So what do you think about how we're going to drive these fascists out? Very, I think it's very related to mass incarceration and torture of people in prison. I, Thank I, you. You're welcome. And I agree. I, I definitely think it's very related. I mean, I said it's related in a lot of ways. I said that you know, we have to focus on local prosecutor elections, right? Not focusing on Jeff Sessions and, or understanding anyway the, the relatively limited role that he has, that he only controls 12% of our criminal justice system. Having said that, 12% is a lot of people. Um, and those are people, there are people right now in federal court that are suffering uh, direct harm because of some of the things that he is trying to institute. There are going to be people that are serving much longer sentences for, in the federal system, mostly nonviolent crimes. Uh, and it's atrocious. The other thing that's happening out of the Trump administration in the criminal justice arena uh, that's, I think, really devastating is, you know, I was talking before about the fact that the folks that I'm writing, that I'm writing about say, you know, we want all of the above. Right? We don't only want a criminal justice response. We do want that, but we want more than that as well. And when you look at the administration and their proposal for health care legislation in particular, they are gutting and proposing to gut the precise kinds of interventions. I said we need to treat this as a public health problem. There's actually, in the Affordable Care Act, we now have funding, my wife's a nurse practitioner, She's, she sees this every day in her clinic. She sees people that come in and are getting treatment for addiction and for mental health issues that are related to addiction that are only getting it because of the expansion of health care under the Affordable Care Act and under the Medicaid uh, expansion in particular. And these are all things, and many of these folks who are getting this care are the precise people that President Trump said that he was running on behalf of. 
A lot of them are white, working class, rural folks in Kentucky, in Pennsylvania. That's, those are the states that I happen to know in Ohio, but I'm quite sure out here as well, who are getting that kind of care and, and now are out of the criminal justice system or have the potential to stay out of the criminal justice system. And what the president is doing and what Jeff Sessions are doing would directly undermine that. I also think, I mean, it's hard to keep up with the daily news, right? I mean, just an hour ago, it seems like some, you know, I, I can't even process the information. Um, it's so rapid and so demoralizing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's also clear to me that nobody before that has assumed the presidency has assumed it with such disdain for the basic norms and ethics of democracy, like the basic structure that has made our, to, to the extent that we've had success as a nation, it has come from following certain precepts that we thought we could take for granted. The notion that you don't just say, well, we're gonna, you're gonna lock up your political opponents. The notion that you don't invite the head of the FBI in to your office and say, so here's the deal, don't investigate my friend, who also, if you investigate him, it might lead to me. Right, you don't do that. It's not what we do. But it is what this gang is doing. And so I do agree with you very much that, I mean, I think 2018 and 2020 are important. But I think very much that before we get there, the only way we're going to stop what they're trying to do before then is if we're vocal, if we're mobilized. We were just talking about this this morning. You know, one of the things I think the mistakes that people make is if you live in a relatively liberal jurisdiction or your senators at least on the national level are voting you know fairly progressively but those folks still need to be pressured because there's a lot right now there's levels of standing up to this administration right there's the well I express concern about what they've done there's the demanding a special prosecutor there's demanding a spe independent investigation and there's also more draconian things like refusing to uh, grant consent for the Senate to continue operation as long as you, we have a president who we have good reason to believe is trying to shut down an investigation that would lead to him. So yeah, there's a lot we need to do. Thank you for sharing your insights about mass incarceration. I'm led to ask about something that is slightly tangential, but maybe not entirely, and that is about education. And having taken note of your uh, experience in founding the charter school, yeah. I'm wondering what comments you may have about education and any learnings that you came upon through your experience with the school. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think education is it's crucial on, on so many levels, right? So it's crucial as a way of this isn't the main reason that people should be educated but it is true that education is incredibly protective against going to prison so just consider the african-american community where mass incarceration has had its most devastating impact right all of america has been harmed black people have been harmed most directly and egregiously even during this period of time when incarceration rates have risen right, this whole mass incarceration period. They haven't risen for African Americans who have attended college. And it's also true that the lifetime risk of incarceration for a black man, these are where we have, the statistics we have are for black men. I suspect this, is, this gap would be true for black women as well, but they haven't run the data on it, not that I've seen. The lifetime risk of incarceration for a black man who's dropped out of high school is 10 times higher than the lifetime risk of incarceration for a black man who's attended college. So, yeah, attended, not even graduated. He's attended this particular data set. Um, so, so we know from that level, right, that it's protective. We also know that, I know from my work with high school students, that one of the things, really the two things, that the students that I worked with who were in the juvenile justice system, when I would ask them, what do you need? What do you want? Like the court system is telling you, 
where you should do X, Y, and Z. But like, I just want to know, what do you want? What do you think if you had that would keep you out of this system, that would get you out and keep you out? And what I heard time and time again was a job and a good school. They're both important. You asked about education. The job part is, is crucial as well because the reason why, one of the reasons why education matters to people is, and I think for those of us that grew up in houses where education and higher education was the norm and grew up in communities where going, where jobs were plentiful, that people don't even realize that this is going on in their minds. But a lot of people get educated because they believe that it is going to lead to a future that has a job that is going to pay them well and to allow them to have a house and live in a neighborhood that they want to live in and have a good life. Like we do, you know, as teachers, we try to make school inherently interesting. <laughs> but like the truth is, it's boring sometimes. And you do it, you stick with it, because you've absorbed certain norms about what it's going to do for you later. Now, if you live in a neighborhood where there are very few jobs, it's hard to convince kids that they should keep their nose to the grindstone and do all of the boring things that you sometimes have to do in school just to learn stuff. And so that's why I think that in communities, that's why you know people say, like I was talking to some folks from Chicago, I was out in Chicago and we were talking about the violence you know, in that city. And people were saying, you know, if you, know, if you were mayor or you were czar, you know, what are the things that you would do? And for me, it's, you know, we have saturation policing, right? We have hot spots policing where we have, when we have a crime wave, we throw, you know, double, triple, quadruple law enforcement detectives, stop and frisks, make busts. And what I want to do is I want to do saturation jobs. I want to take those neighborhoods, you give me the three or four most high crime neighborhoods in any city, and you say, I was just at, I just was at Starbucks today, I was talking to them about this. You put jobs, whether it's factories, whether it's infrastructure jobs. You know, I'm, I live in New Haven, which has a very high unemployment rate and is a poor African American city. It also has the largest employer, Yale University, which is building stuff all the time. Like you walk around Yale and there's scaffolding on every third building. And you hardly ever see black people working on those projects. This is in a city full of black people who can do those jobs. And who can be trained to do those jobs. If they can't do them today, they can do them after a month or two of training. And then the president of the university sits idly by and they send out reports. Every day we get alerts about another crime that's taken place on this corner and that corner and the next corner. And I just want to shake the administration and say, don't you see the connection? Nobody has a job. There's crime. You have jobs that are available. You could do something to solve the moral crisis. And by the way, you might have a university that people didn't always know as a place where there were shootings going on every week or month. But we're, so, jo so I think alongside schools, it's gotta, it's gotta be jobs. And that to me is just, that's like, you know, I said earlier, it's not one thing, there's no silver bullet, right? It's a million things, we all gotta pitch in. And I believe all of that. But if you hammer me down and you're like, all right, I know, but I don't have time for a thousand. I can only do two. My two are going to be jobs in schools. And if you're like, you can only do one, it's going to be jobs. Hey, thanks for being here, Professor. Um, I thought I would just see if I could get your reflections on, on a local issue that is hot right now. I just came from Seattle University where another city council meeting was unfolding. Um, about a change to an ordinance that um, may help the city this, these two members of the city council put um, pressure on helping to delay uh, the construction of this youth and family justice center 
as some people call it, in the youth jail, as other people call it. Um, we're in the company of esteemed leaders in the youth justice uh, uh, community, as I'm sure you know. Um, and I'm sure you also know that over the last 10, 15 years, there's been tremendous effort in uh, decreasing the size of uh, the youth incarcerated population, but the racial disparity problem remains a big one. Um, a couple of years ago, the Seattle City Council passed an ordinance uh, committing to a city uh, with no youth incarceration, zero youth incarceration. They said laudable goal, um, and yet uh, the county and the city carry, for, carry on with uh, these efforts to construct this $210 million jail. Uh, Youth Justice Center, excuse me, uh, rhetoric. Um, <laughs> um, but there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a big tension, there's a fundamental tension there. You know, we, we haven't gotten rid of this, youth dis this racial disparity problem. Uh, we might still need a place for violent young people to go, although obviously there's a debate to be had on that question. I'm curious how you think we can sort of reconcile this goal of ending uh, youth incarceration um, with the need that some people feel that we still need these places. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. So I can't, I, oh, is it the last question? So I can't comment, I, I don't think I can comment on the, the precise details that are mo in this debate, just because I do think that where you come down on a particular legislative issue is very, the community specific, it's context specific, the details matter. Um, so I, 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 you know, I can't, I don't have a position one way or the other on that. Um, but I do, I can share, I guess, um, maybe two, for me, two ways of thinking about it that grow out of my experience in DC. So one has to do with the debate that we had in the city that I, again, I don't know how now, exactly how analogous it was, but I was part of a movement for, you know, at least a decade, um, clo closed Oak Hill, right? And that Oak Hill is the place that I described before, the juvenile jail in DC. And uh, it was about a 200, it was, I think it, it, it was maybe 180, but they sometimes could push up to 200, 220 when they kind of overfilled it. And it was, it was over, you know, count or whatever, um, a lot in the 90s. And so we were pushing close, 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 close Oak Hill. And then this guy, Vinnie Schiraldi, who was part of the close Oak Hill coalition, was made the head of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation. Basically, the mayor said to him, like, you've been killing me for a decade. And like, why don't you, you, you fix it. Like, you be in charge. Like, make the system be the way you want it to be. And so, Shiraldi did two, th did, you, you should bring him here to, to ask him this question. He's, he's great, a phenomenal speaker. But I think that he did three things that I viewed as very progressive and the right thing. The first is that he got the city to commit to a plan to build a new facility because the old one was a dungeon and it was, in his estimation, it wasn't actually possible to have zero beds. That if you went to zero, all the city was gonna do was gonna, the judges were still gonna find some kids who were, they believed were gonna be, needed to be secured or locked up or jailed or whatever language we want to use for it, and they were just going to send them to private, residential, contractual facilities that the city already had a relationship with. And I think he was right about that. So his deal was get the size down. So he got the size down to 50. So the new facility had 50 beds instead of 200. That was number one. Number two was that the architecture matters a lot. And so the facility that was built, the, the replacement, which is called New Beginnings, um, was, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, as, long as, as long as it wasn't called Oak Hill, I was in. Uh, was, is a, it is still a locked juvenile facility, but it is, a much more humane environment than the old one was. The, the, the sort of um, housing units are smaller. They don't have, 
They're not jail cells like the other ones were. They are more like, they have more of a feel of, they look more like, like a dormitory at a, at a university. And there's these, and there's sort of grounds. It's just a much nicer physical environment. And then the biggest, and then the biggest thing was, he said, okay, so the architecture matter. And then the other thing that matters is the, the school in the middle of the facility and all of the staff that work at the facility. So, because kids are, in theory, were supposed to go to school at this old facility, but nobody did because it was such a nightmare. They actually had barbed wire around the school, so there was this whole jail that had barbed wire. And then there was a school inside of it with barbed wire around the school. And when we went to visit, because my, my nonprofit got asked whether we wanted to put in, respond to an RFP to run the school, and we had a whole bunch of conditions and the first thing is, is why is there barbed wire around? You gotta get rid of the barbed wire. And, but nobody could, no one, ha, no one could, we asked like 50 people, why is there barbed wire around the school? And nobody could tell us, like, this is the thing, these systems are so dysfunctional that, that nobody even knows why they do some of the crazy stuff that they do. So anyway, he made the school an excellent school and he retrained all the staff. This is still an ongoing process. It is far from perfect, but the, tra the staff were, and the worst offenders were fired, and a lot of new people were brought in, and the amount of violence in that facility has you know, declined over 90%, both student on student and staff on student, um, and student on staff, and so, to me, you know, those three things have made this place not an, uh, not an ideal, because ideally you wouldn't have a facility like that at all. If you were going to have places like that, they would be much smaller, six or eight people perhaps in them and in the, in the city. This is like, pr this one in D.C. is pretty far outside the city. Um, but it's a lot, lot better. And I feel like most of the youth justice advocates and certainly my clients um, and their families think of this place that we now have as, you know, I don't know, if, if we're at zero and we're trying to get to 100, we, you know, we started at zero and this is like 60 or 70. Or, you know, it's a lot of progress. It's real progress as compared, I mean, kids are not brutalized and they are not violated and they are not traumatized. Anything to the extent that they were in the old one. It's still traumatic and it is still terrible for a 15 or 16 year old to be taken out of their home and placed in a facility like this. It is. Um, but. So, you know, to me, this is like the constant tension of like social justice movements and public policy, right, and reform and is trying to figure out how you build, you create successes and then build further on those successes and you never lose sight of the fact, you celebrate the fact that a place like Oak Hill is so much better, a place like New Beginnings is so much better than a place like Oak Hill and at the same time, you never lose sight of the fact that we have to become a society where there aren't anything like, there are no places like New Beginnings either. And that's just to me is the constant struggle.